Let's Talk About Mitts Baby is sponsored by Signature Hardware. If you're looking for that perfect item to take your kitchen, bathroom, or just your house up a notch, head over to SignatureHardware.com. They have honestly some of the most beautiful housewares I've ever seen. The vanities? Oh my god vanities. Who knew they could be so absolutely stunning? And I am a big bathtub person. So yes, I've just longingly scrolled through all of their bathtub options because why not? They've got beautiful bathroom furnishings and kitchen furnishings. You could get an incredible rain shower or this a beautiful farmhouse sink or maybe just a beautiful one of those things that hangs over your bathtubs. So you can have a glass of wine. I've actually picked out eight different furnishings that really stood out to me on Signature Hardware. They're my style. I just love them. They're absolutely just goals. See for yourself at SignatureHardware.com slash myths. You will be amazed at the variety and the quality. Oh, hi. Hello. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm Liv that host of yours. You know the one. Kind of crazy, supremely feminist. Anyway, I'm back with another mini-myth, and today I want you to think back to an episode from the very beginning of this podcast. Think back, or maybe re-listen, to my episode on Phaethon, the son of the sun god Helios, who borrowed his father's chariot, trying himself to bring the sun across the sky one day, only to cause his death. There's more to it, but again, re-listen to that episode because I'm not here to tell you the same thing I told you years ago. And because of my source, today's episode features the story from my favorite man himself, Ovid. These are stories originating in Greek mythology that the Romans too believed, and that Ovid retold in his magnificent, marvelous Metamorphoses. Mini-Myth, Heliades and the Many Stories of Cygnus. After Phaethon falls to his tragic death, he lands far away from his home in the river Po. There, naiads of the river bury his body, erecting a gravestone memorializing the boy. Helios, his father, is incredibly distraught, and the world lives in darkness for some time. But his mother, the titan Clymene, she doesn't handle it as well as Helios, if that even could be called handling it well. She goes a bit wild, tearing at her hair and clothes, a symbol of despair and mourning in ancient Greece, and she wanders the earth searching for her son's body. And when too much time has passed, searching for only his bones... Finally, she finds them on the banks of the river Po with the lovingly carved gravestone. She wraps herself around his grave, crying and crying. And finally, she's joined there by her daughters, Phaethon's sisters. Together, they're called the Heliades, daughters of Helios. For four days, the daughters of Helios, sisters of Phaethon, mourn their brother, crying over his grave. Finally, the oldest, Phaethusa, notices that her legs have grown very stiff. She complains to her sister, Lampicia, who tries to help before realizing she, too, is stiff. But not just stiff. Their legs are rooted to the earth as, well, roots. Another sister cries out, grasping at her hair, only to find branches and leaves. This continues on. Every sister discovers, slowly, dramatically that they're becoming trees. They have leaves and boughs and bark growing on their skin. Finally, they transform so much that all that's left of the girls is their human mouths calling out for their mother. Clymene is there in a split second, trying to free her daughters from the trees that she sees is engulfing them. But she quickly realizes that they're not being covered in these trees. They are themselves becoming the trees. As she tries to break them free, they cry out in pain, and she's forced to stop. She gives them each a kiss, and then they're covered and fully transformed into these trees. The Heliades have become poplar trees, and their sap turns to amber. 
Ovid says that the river's waters bring the amber downstream and that it will eventually become the jewelry of the women of Rome. The transformation, or metamorphosis, as Ovid would prefer, I say, of the Heliades into poplar trees isn't only witnessed by their mother, Clymene. A young man from nearby, the son of Sthenelus named Cygnus, has also watched it happen. The name Cygnus could be spelled or pronounced differently. It's spelled Cygnus, C-Y-C-N-U-S, originally, but it's been sort of anglicized and also there is a greek version that's cygnus and i'm gonna say cygnus because it just sounds clearer in my accent apologies cygnus is related to phaethon we're told though ovid doesn't mention how but more than that he's just very close with him linked to phaethon by a deep affection so ovid says this cygnus because spoilers there are many was set to be king of all of liguria But when he sees what has happened to Phaethon and then to his sisters, he puts aside his kingship. Instead, he chooses to mourn the siblings on the banks of the river Po. At the riverside, Cygnus too cries over the gravestone of Phaethon and now the poplar trees of the Heliades. But as he cries, his cries grow quieter and quieter. And just as the Heliades a short time ago, he too begins to transform. Cygnus's hair becomes hidden by fluffy white plumage. His neck extends, growing longer and longer. His fingers slowly become webbed and redder than they were moments ago. Wings extend from the sides of his body, covered in fluffy white feathers. And at the end of the transformation, a beak forms on his mouth, and he's become a swan. Ovid says that as a swan, Cygnus remembers the fiery lightning bolt Zeus used to stop Phaethon, and that because of this, he seeks out water, lakes, and pools, the opposite of fire. According to one version, eventually Apollo places Cygnus in the sky as the constellation, well, Cygnus, the swan. The next Cygnus is from the time of the Trojan War. He fought on the side of the Trojans, though this version, too, comes from Ovid. In the first year of the war, and in the heat of one of the early battles between the Greeks and the Trojans, we return back to Achilles. At this moment, the shores of a nearby river amongst the battle have grown red. Cygnus, this Cygnus, has made a name for himself already. The son of Neptune, Poseidon, had killed a thousand men, so it's Achilles looking to defeat him. He rides through the fray, searching for this man who's already caused so much damage. Finally, Achilles spots Cygnus and calls out to him, announcing he's about to be killed by Achilles. It's very showy, very dramatic, very Achilles, but ultimately anticlimactic. Because when Achilles... Achilles, mind you, throws his spear at Cygnus, it simply bounces off of him. No damage done. This is concerning for Achilles and all the Greeks watching. Not something you see every day, a man able to repel weapons, a man whose skin is seemingly untouchable. Cygnus laughs. Oh, Achilles, son of a goddess, he says. Are you surprised to see me unscathed? Do you see my helmet, my armor, my shield? Cygnus continues, pointing out these things that he's wearing. They're just for show. Just like they're only for show when the god Mars wears them. If you were to remove all my armor, I would still escape unscathed. In fact, he says with a smirk, I can beat you even in parentage. My mother is no nereid like yours. My father rules Nereus and his nereids. That's right. My father is Neptune himself. With that, Cygnus hurls his spear at Achilles, and it pierces through many layers of his protection, stopping just before it touches his skin. 
Achilles throws it off of him, and once again he tries to shoot an arrow at Cygnus, but the same thing happens again. He tries another time, and another. Nothing. Achilles looks down at his own hand, wondering, is something wrong? Have I become weak? He asks himself, where is my godly strength? Looking around, he decides he's got to test it. So he throws his spear at another man. The first that he sees, it pierces him deeply, and the man falls to the ground, dead. Angrier now, Achilles frees his spear and once again throws it straight into Cygnus. But once again, it bounces off. This time, though, it leaves a speck of blood. For a moment, Achilles is thrilled, thinking he's at last just at least pierced the skin of Cygnus. But after a moment, he realizes, no, it's not that. It's simply the blood of the man he's just killed, left over on the spear, and then transferred to Cygnus. He is still unscathed. Achilles is furious now. This simply can't be. He's Achilles. He can kill anyone. He loses it. He starts raining blows down on Cygnus, hitting him over and over, wrapped around the man, beating him senseless. Though he's not injured yet, Cygnus begins to panic. He's overwhelmed at the least. He staggers backward and trips over a rock, falling to the ground. This is all Achilles needs. He jumps on him, pinning him down and untying the man's armor. He uses the tie to wrap around Cygnus's neck, pulling tighter and tighter until, finally unable to breathe, the man whose skin could not be pierced dies. But when Achilles begins to remove the armor, the symbol that Cygnus has finally been defeated, he finds there's no body beneath it. No human body, at least. Beneath this armor is a swan, transformed by Neptune. Cygnus has, in this story too, become a swan. Our final story of another Cygnus is told only briefly in Ovid while he's talking about Medea. Oh, Medea. I have something to say about her later. But for now, another Cygnus. This boy lives in a region near the Lake Hyrie. There, he was served by a man named Phileas. Phileas trained birds and even a lion, and he gave all these trained, tamed animals to Cygnus as gifts. Next, Cygnus asks him to tame a wild bull. But when he does, he then refuses to give the bull to Cygnus because, it seems, Phileas has also been in love with Cygnus the whole time, and he's been rebuffed too many times. Cygnus, furious he's not being given the wild bull he asked for, cries out at Phileas that he'll wish he'd given Cygnus the gift, and with that, he jumps off a high towering cliff. Everyone watching assumes Cygnus has just killed himself, but no. Within moments, they see him flying in the air with his bright white wings. This Cygnus, too, has become a swan. Thank you all for listening. There's actually another Cygnus, if you can believe it, but he's to do with old Heracles, so I'll tell his story when I return to the escapades of the world's most famous hero. There's still so much to say about him. I find it really interesting that there are so many stories where a man named Cygnus gets turned into a swan. I can't really think of that many others, because it's also not, they're not meant to be the same person. It's individual people named Cygnus all turned into swans. I mean, the word Cygnus does mean swan, but regardless, it's rare that that happens in mythology. Now, back to when I briefly mentioned Medea. So, I'm really interested in doing another, far more in-depth episode on her. She's fascinating, and there's so much to her, I didn't even scratch the surface in my episode featuring her and Jason. And ideally, within that episode, or maybe even in another episode to itself, I want to talk all about the witchcraft of ancient Greece. 
Medea, Circe, Hecate. There's so many witches, but their stories aren't all that detailed or defined in the typical mythology. So all to say, I've added a few books on ancient Greek magic, witchcraft, necromancy to my online book list in the event anyone wants to donate to the show in the form of one of those books. To view my book list and possibly make a donation if you want, just visit mythsbaby.com slash book dash donation, or you can also access the page by going to my site and clicking on One Help, which features all the ways you can contribute to me in this podcast, should you feel so inclined. Of course, thank you if you choose to donate, thank you if you can't, or straight up don't want to. The fact that you listen to the show is enough. You're all wonderful. I will be back next week with some bloodshed. I'm Liv, and I do love this shit.